Well, welcome to the show, anybody out there who is uh, watching at the moment on the YouTube feed. We love you all so very much, and welcome to the show. <clears throat> hello, hello, and welcome to the show show, the number one podcast for regular humans who like podcasts. In this episode, we will be discussing the 2020 second season of FX's sensational comedy series from the great Jermaine Clement. I'll be honest, my lookalike is kind of giving me a chub. Today on the show show, what we do in the shadows again. Season two, we are your host. I am Aaron. You can find me on Twitter at Tenacious Aaron. I'm Jay. You can find me out there at, at Jay Suisponte. And I'm Tony. You can find me on social media at T Pinquite. You can also find the show on Twitter at the show show pod, or you can send us emails at the show show TV podcast at gmail.com. Now, before we dive into season two, uh, I do want to note that this is a show that we have covered previously. So if anybody's new to the show, welcome. And secondly, you can also find our previous episode on the first season of what we do in the shadows. Uh, but that was also an episode that predated Tony's membership of the show show. So I was curious, Tony, uh, any, you know, any thoughts, any, you know, rating on what you'd give to the first season, if, if it's something that you uh, can remember? Well, yeah, it's been a long time since I saw the first season. I remember enjoying it, but I don't remember uh, having any sort of strong feeling either way, I guess. I remember it being good. I was a big fan of the movie with Jermaine Clement and Taika Waititi. Uh, apologies to the other actors and actresses in that film. I don't remember your names, but I remember I was a huge fan of the film. Really enjoyed the first season. I don't think as much as the movie when I first watched it. I think maybe I have a new appreciation now after watching the second season again uh so i remember being good but i don't have any strong feelings about the first season yeah fair fair enough uh i think at, in our last episode a couple of us mentioned that we might want to go back and watch the first season but at least unfortunately for myself um, i was watching this on hulu and the first season was no longer available that's crazy to me like, yeah, is it isn't it disappointing when they do that? Yeah, like I, Hulu's the only one that I feel really does this anymore, but cycles out like parts of a show or parts of a season. And it's just like, come on. Like, it's the internet. They told us that everything's going to be on there forever. So that's why I don't do stuff, stupid stuff and post on social media. But like, there are lots of shows like Drew Carey Show, not even online. You can't even stream it. Like, it, it drives me crazy, some of this shit. Yeah, the, there was this great sitcom that aired on CBS in the early aughts that was called Still Standing. Uh, if, if anybody remembers this, it starred uh, Jamie Gertz and oh, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but the, the actor who played Robert Baratheon on uh, Game of Thrones. And it was just a hilarious little family sitcom. But is it anywhere to stream? No, it's nowhere to be found. I'm looking on my phone. I was just able to select season one. Uh, I don't know if that's just a new thing or if maybe you have to go to episodes and change it to, I don't know. I see season one on my apps right now, but maybe oh, that, no. maybe that's did, just this weekend or something. Did I just reveal how tech dumb I am like <laughs> on the air? I don't know. It could have just been like a very recent development. I just see it now. So if you're scared of well, it's, not it's, it's, season one, it's just, are there like, was there two? Was there one? Was there five? There's well, two there's... and the third just started. Right. So. Well, good uh, news, listeners. Season one is out there for anybody who wants to rewatch. Well, it. and to be fair, to be fair, Hulu Jay does put in a call cycling. and made it happen. It was not there before the podcast, but. Spotify exec listening live or uh, Hulu exec listening live, you know, to the YouTube channel. And uh, they're like, oh, we'll fix that right away. When I say dance, they say how high. <laughs> <sighs> well, this was a show that I think really epitomizes what the show show is all about for me personally, because I never would have watched this show 
if it weren't for the show show. I think this was picked for Aaron way back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I turned out to love it. One of the, you know, one of the shows I look forward to most when it comes out now. So I am eternally grateful to the show show forever for a lot of reasons, but particularly because of what we do in the shadows. I, I think that honestly, it's one of the better sitcoms that I've seen lately. Like just of all the sitcoms that are coming out, new, old, everything. I, I am always looking forward to the new episode of what we do in the shadows. So this, this show really does like nail every aspect of, I feel like the dark comedy of, of our time period. A hundred percent agree. And the, can, we, can I also say this? Just everyone's performance in it in season two is so good. Mm-hmm. Like like Colin Robinson, Laszlo, Nadia, Guillermo. I love Guillermo. Just one of my favorite. And Nandor. Like each of them have just such great performances in season two. I I it was superb. It was a superb season. Absolutely. You're the, the performance is spot on the, uh, the guest stars as well. You know, they, they really brought that in season one and they continued that in season two, you know, really couldn't be happy. Couldn't be happier with the actors. I mean, I didn't, I, Christy had to call it out like that. It was Mark Hamill. I did not realize that Jim, the vampire was Mark Hamill when I was watching it. Like I, he's so good. So mm. damn good. Yeah, I'll, I'll admit I made it through the whole. I made it until the credits when I saw his name, and i i was com- I was completely taken in. So, <laughs> you know. Also, Haley Joel Osment's zombie was so <laughs> so good, <It's> amazing. <laughs> oh man! Well, I guess is there any episode specifically that sticks out to you? I think I, I can safely say that uh, the Jackie Daytona episode is uh, that that was a real high point of the the season for me. <laughs> yeah, no that that episode was fantastic. I I thought that I, I've loved the story of and of course spoiler cast of Guillermo slowly coming into his roots as a um, vampire hunter like unintentionally and the whole sequence with the. Um, uh, the vampire hunting club was so good. So <laughs> yes, <awesome. laughs> and and I, whenever the one kid keeps suggesting that they have an orgy so that none of them are virgins, like <laughs> to me, number one, that that just made it so more so real. Like I feel like there'd always be that person there. But Craig Robinson was so good in that too. Like like I was laughing so much. <laughs> no man, you need to quit suggesting that. Fantastic use of Craig Robinson, the great yeah. Craig Robinson. <laughs> oh man, but, but Guillermo's performance so good. Yeah, speaking of Guillermo, uh, before we got on the air, I was trying to think of if I were to describe the story of season two, what happens, and I think really the only character who has an arc at all is Guillermo, because he has his whole story, like you said, while. Everyone else really just stays the same. And I don't mean this as a criticism at all. Uh, This actually kind of leads me to my theory that I've been working on of why this show is so good. That it's like Seinfeld, but with vampires. (laughs) Because there's, there's no hugging, there's no learning, there's no growing. There is a little a progression with Guillermo where he like gets the the day off and you know mm-hmm. well like with the exception of, of Guillermo himself, you know these vampires they're they're all stuck in their ways, which is kind of the joke to begin with because they they lead this Victorian life and the what makes them funny, I think is. Exactly that. You know, the the very ending of this season, I think, uh, is evidence of that, where Guillermo has just slayed the entire theater of vampires, and they are still completely, the, the, the four main vampires from the house are on stage and still completely focused on themselves. And yeah, like, I think Nando's first statement is like, Guillermo, do you have something to tell us? <laughs> Yes, and then Guillermo <laughs> reveals that he's a vampire hunter, that his last name is literally of the cross in Spanish. 
Yeah. And their response is, I don't give a shit what your name is. Get us out of here. No, it was, it was, we had to do our own laundry. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, well, it's, it's very much, it, and I, I think that your assessment that it's kind of like Seinfeld with vampires is really good. I, I think it's interesting because, I had read that Guillermo was not intentionally supposed to be a big character. It was just a bit piece at the beginning, but audiences reacted so well to the character that they really just kind of jumped off the deep end with it. I could a hundred percent see that, uh, that he'd be, he'd be the breakout character of the show. I mean, the, in the first episode of this season, you know, very early on, we get that quick scene where Guillermo spills all the, the chocolate covered espresso beans <laughs> in the bathroom and, yeah. and Nandor tells him to drink more water. Uh, that, like that b- between Lindsay and I, that just became a thing we'd say to each other. Oh, Guillermo. Maybe well, drink yeah. more water. It's, it's good. Like that's all I can say is that like every episode had personality. It was funny. The acting was good. And I, I, Matthew Berry's voice just can rock me to sleep at night. Like it's one of the best voices on television. And that's all I can say. Would the show be I'm less sorry, funny if everyone, I guess Matthew Berry just has kind of an English accent, but would it be as funny if Nandor and Nadja's accents weren't so over the top Eastern European? I think that's part of like that. Their voices are almost a character that cracks me up. Especially mm-hmm. the way Nod just says arseholes or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the arseholes. The arseholes. That's that's true, and and Nandor as well. Just the the way that he he enunciates certain words, you know, it it lends this like whimsical comedy to very, very gruesome things he says, and that's one of the things that makes the show work. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's another show that uh, I think Tony and I have talked about off the air that is it's on Netflix. It's a docu series about about Formula One racing, and there's one particular guy who gets featured who sounds exactly like Nandor, but he's like really? a real life person. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah, it's true. It's the he's the head of the Haas team, but I can't remember his name. But anytime he comes on the screen, he's talking about you know car racing you know things that a, a vampire of course would never be speaking about and just cracks me up because it just makes me think of nandor and his pillaging <laughs> there is so much pillaging <laughs> that that episode where they found out that that nandor had pillaged <laughs> nadja's vid- village that was amazing yeah no that was so good and it was it was funny because like he his his whole persona was just like I don't even remember we did so much pillaging, like like it's funny to me also they've been alive for so long how can you keep up with all the memories mm-hmm. right like the episode where he's getting on the emails to check his letter to his emails and dealing with the chain letter like number one like how many emails do you think he has if he's just an email account he checks every like ten years like. <laughs> I, I don't he know. He only had like three, which is the crazy part. That's that's such bullshit. You know that they would yeah. be finding out his emails and sending him a whole bunch of crazy shit. I I don't understand why. I guess they don't have cell phones yet. That's that's where I think that they need to go in the next season is like them having cell phones and dealing with all this new technology. Because I feel like they could, there's a lot of boomer jokes that they can make with that. Oh, I don't 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 you think that that breaks the spell somewhat and 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 kind of constrains a little bit of the joke? No, because I feel like their interactions with the 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 Super Bowl party was hilarious. Like you know, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of like the smashing together of the old and the new that I find it so charming. Like to, at least that's one thing that I really like. So like when again, whenever he's dealing with the the mundane school schoolgirls volleyball team. Right, and, and small town life as a bartender, like that's the stuff that's really funny to me. So, like putting them in more situations like that, where they actually have to deal with modernity, so to speak, I think that that kind of is where some of the funny lies. 
Yeah, fa- fair enough on that because I I caught myself thinking about the the Day- the Jackie Daytona episode and thinking about why it was so good. And I think one of the reasons is that the plot of that episode is very simple. Like especially once Jackie gets to the town, because it, it's it's as simple as we need to raise money for the local team. Let's put on a show. You know, it's it's the oldest sitcom plot in the book, but. By making Laszlo the one at the head of it, it's hilarious because yeah. the way he goes about it. I I also think it was really funny whenever he like burned down the the bar to pay for everything, but then he had yeah. to burn down another bar because he killed someone by accident and had to pay for their funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and when he gets into the truck and just drives it into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I never learned how to drive the damn thing. <laughs> Matthew Barry, the the great Matthew Barry. He's not in enough stuff. He gives great fantasy football advice, though. Okay. <laughs> uh, ew. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the episode that di- directly precedes the Jackie Daytona episode was also a highlight for me. That was the Colin Robinson becoming too powerful at work. Yeah, no, that was really good. Amazing, amazing. Colin Robinson, I, I think, maybe not my favorite character because I think it's going to be Laszlo, but Colin Robinson, I think, is the most interesting character to me. Yeah. Just the entire concept of the energy vampire, I think, is a great like modern day kind of fairy tale thing. If you know what I mean, like it's a fantastical explanation for those little irks of life that we all have to deal with. No, I I agree. I think that it's it takes a a great kind of criticism of the office culture too, just like all the ways he's able to screw around with it and kind of point out how people waste time and (laughs) just, you know, fuck around. But I I also find it really interesting, like the episode with him trolling and, and them kind of getting into social media stuff. Like that that's kind of the stuff that I think is really interesting. And Colin Robinson's a great way to kind of critique those things and mm-hmm. poke fun at them. So uh, I think that he's a great vehicle. I, I will say I, I I hope that they go more into kind of where the energy vampires come from because they've kind of alluded to like don't don't know where we came from. We're just here. So I think that they have some some growth there potential with Colin Robinson. But I also don't see how they could do any much growth with anyone but Colin Robinson, kind of based how they've set up the characters. Right. You know, as a as these vampires are immortal, you know, I think, you know, I think that's that's kind of the right way to go with that joke of they need to stay the same. Mm-hmm. Do you think they can uh, hold off on Guillermo becoming a vampire for a whole other season or like? into perpetuity or you think he'll eventually have to become a vampire i ooh, i think it's getting slightly old at this point to me i don't know i'll have to disagree on the colin robinson like i love colin robinson's like one-liners and like just in short doses i love the character but i can't stand him when he's like <laughs> it's a major part of the episode i just don't like it personally is he draining you? I guess so. It's working through the television. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt if you were going to talk about Guillermo. Oh, you were, you were talking about how like, if they can string us along longer. I, I think my response would be, I guess I, I hope they do continue to string us along. Because it would almost be like, that would be like when, when Jim and Pam got together. It's like, yeah. Uh, that tension is gone. So if they can continue to creatively continue that story, I think I'd rather see Guillermo continue his path towards vampire hunter rather than become a vampire. I agree with that. I think it's the more interesting twist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A question I had, uh, the finale, I guess I watched most of the season and then it took a little break and watched the finale. It seemed like, Maybe it was just literally uh, Nandor blaming the familiar because, I mean, who hasn't done it? But it seemed kind of like maybe he knew all along that 
Guillermo was killing all these vampires that were trying to kill them. Like, for sure he knew he killed Carol. Was it Carol, the weird fish-looking vampire? Why does she look like Carol, Guillermo? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Where's Carol? I don't see her. Carol? (laughs) Nick Kroll. That was so good. (laughs) The great Nick Kroll. But it seemed like maybe he, or maybe all three of them were even aware. And maybe that's why they weren't even that surprised when he went off and killed everybody at the end, too. I I guess I was just so uh, convinced that they were so selfish that they didn't notice that by by the time we got to the end, like that was that was the joke to me was that they were completely oblivious of just how much Guillermo was doing to keep them safe. I, I think that there is a certain element of willful blindness to them. Like they don't want to know, so they don't care to pay attention so it's kind of like, like, how do you not know that the vampires are coming after you for months? You know, like, I just, I feel like you're going to know that they're, they're after you at some point, but they were oblivious to that too. So. I mean, we saw a tiny taste of that in the, in the finale, which sticks out in my mind because I watched it only like an hour ago. Uh, but it's, it's right at the start of the episode where they're showing how terrible things have gotten at the house without a familiar cleaning up. And there's just a fire on the table and Nadja's saying, Nandor, like, aren't like, didn't you put out the the candles last night before we went to bed? And he said, no, the candles are in the hallway. They're not in my room, therefore not my responsibility. So even though the house is literally like could literally burn down, he doesn't care because it's it's with outside of his little realm. Yep. I I think also the, the, the right there at the end, there's a little bit of a janky feeling, almost maybe like the episodes are a little out of order because we go from like the, the memos man milk episode to, you know, him leaving very quickly thereafter. And I felt like that felt a little out of consistency. Did anybody else feel that way towards the end of the season? Yeah. hundred yeah. percent. As, as sorry. If I was talking, I think I have an echo. Um, I downloaded the season to watch on a while traveling, and for some reason, episode nine did not download. So I actually watched episode eight and then the finale, which is episode 10. And I was like, what? Like, I'd watched episode nine before, but I don't remember there being like a specific spark for Guillermo leaving because of the beginning of episode 10, he's just gone. Yep. I thought, okay, I'll find out in episode nine when I watch it. And I watched it. I'm like, there's no transition, there's no segue from like episode nine to episode 10. 10 the beginning where Guillermo's just like basically abandoned his post and gone back home to live with his family, his mother. It it didn't, there was no lead up to it that made sense. It just kind of was like, well, this is how we're going to end the season. It almost felt like there was like additional episodes that were cut and they never did anything to tie back into how they were going to end the series. Like maybe this was like a le- episode 12 and there was an 11 and a different 11 and 10 that we just don't get. So... Yeah, maybe so, because it fe- seemed like he was going to start benefiting by selling his Mimo's man milk to the witches. <laughs> so, like, at least he's being mistreated and not appreciated, but he's going to start making some profit, at least. So I feel like his situation was maybe even improving for being with the vampires. Well, the the episode before the witch episode with the man milk, that was the one where... Uh, Guillermo got caught up with the other vampire and her like collective of familiars where she was promising all of them that they would eventually become vampires, but it it finally clicks for him that they're just never going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think maybe the combination of that, that being reinforced that he's never going to be made a vampire and then followed by the encounter with the witches of, you know, he's, he's reminding them that he's got his own skill set beyond his masters, you know, maybe, but that's, you know, that's all I can put together, really. It just felt a little bit jarring walking into episode 10 and, and Guillermo's just gone. Right. It just felt out of place. It felt like the direction the arc was going was like, yeah, he was fed up and that's why he went to the other vampires. And then he was finally like standing up for himself, but ready to come back and like demand more respect. So, like, he was coming back, I felt like. And then even the witches episode, he was back, and then he was going to 
start profiting. So I feel like it was, I feel like it was moving in a direction to make him more closely tied to the vampires than further away is why it kind of was weird for me. Yeah, same here. I agree with that. Sounds like we just needed more episodes. I I, I don't disagree. I wonder yeah. if there's a way to check and see if there was episodes cut. Next time on the show show. <laughs> Season three, episode one and two review. <laughs> well, it looks like each season is 10 episodes, a, ni- a nice round number. So, you know, beyond that, that I don't really know, but uh, I'd, right. I'd love to get some more. Well, maybe I've just got the conspiracy theories left over from the Mosquito Coast. <laughs> oh, man. Let's not go back there. <laughs> <laughs> We did, I'm proud of us, we did have a pretty quick turnaround. Has it only been like two, three weeks maybe since the last pod? Yeah, but also it's a 20 episode, twenty minute episode show, so I feel like those are just so much easier to consume than like the 40 minute where there's a little bit more drama, serious, you know, storytelling. So I think that that kind of helped. It's also not that much, 10 episodes, 20 minutes an episode, that's nothing. Yeah, yeah it sounds smooth. Yeah, exactly. It's you know a, a show we all knew that we were gonna like, so it's it's a lot easier to psych yourself up to watch that. It's very true. It's very true. So and I think for some of us, we'd already seen it once, and so that also didn't you know hurt at all. Yeah, it's not quite stomaching eighteen episodes of Siesta Key. Oh, <laughs> those were like forty-five minutes episodes weren't they they were there's a full hour i guess minus 20 minutes cut commercials oh yeah and there's three more seasons of it guys just waiting for us (laughs) i think that's like a punishment thing i just like put that on the wheel of punishment (laughs) we'll start a fantasy football league and that's if you come in last place you must watch (laughs) all siesta key episodes and create a timeline (laughs) That would be my pleasure. I'll, I'll piggyback to something you said earlier, Jay, about no one having any arcs. I think we had like a little small mini arc for Nandor, but only because he's tied so closely to Guillermo. It's like you start to see him. I guess you always knew he cared about him, but you start to see, I guess, more the depths of like he actually cares about him. And even his old familiar that he let get to be like, I don't know, 70 years old. He eventually turned him into a vampire, so you kind of get a small, tiny little bit of Nandor character development. But I agree on all the other characters; they all kind of were pretty static. Well, what do you think about Nadja and her doll? Creepy. They yeah. kind of just dropped it. I thought it was going to be well. Some. It popped back up at the end with Guillermo. Mm-hmm. Remember, the doll was the one that told him about what was going on. Yeah, but no, I, I also agree they they. They're not using a lot of the tools I feel like they can be using. But I do like how much they've used all the different, like, other, like, lore, like, witches and ghosts and werewolves and, and all that stuff. Like, that, they've done a really good job, in my opinion. Zombies, like, incorporating all this other kind of, like, generic horror crap. Especially the way that they do it, where a lot of them, they treat like they're, like, household nuisances or pests. Yeah. <laughs> like the ghost episode. Oh, geez, we've got ghosts. And then even within that, how some of them disagree on whether ghosts actually exist. Yeah. You know, just the, the concept of a fairy tale creature disbelieving the existence of another one. You know. Well, and the Guillermo kind of meta calling it out and being like, so werewolves exist, but ghosts don't? Hello? <laughs> kind of ridiculous. <laughs> What is what is all over your room? Is this ectoplasm on the ceiling? Yes, yes, it is ectoplasm. For when uh, Laszlo had to help his ghost with his unfinished business. <laughs> <laughs> do do you think that there is any room for improv, or everything is scripted in the show? I would really be shocked if. Uh, like if Matt Barry did any scripted, well, I shouldn't say any, but like you've got, if you've got Matt Barry 
you've got to let him you've got to let him improv, don't you? I feel I feel that I agree with you. Just like remember the 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 scene where like Nandor and uh uh Laszlo are standing there with their erections and they're <laughs> Like that scene just felt to me like it was a uh, just an improv moment. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it, it would not shock me at all. Uh, based on the, what little I know about these actors, you know, I, it wouldn't really surprise me because the the actor who plays uh, Nandor, his claim to fame originally was that he he rose to prominence doing prank calls. And, really? Yeah, uh, and. You know that that's exactly the kind of extemporaneous kind of thing that you need to need to do improv with. And then Nadja, the the other thing I know her from is a British sitcom called Staff Let's Flats, that is you know very much the same kind of style of very dry humor that you just it, it feels like it's got to be improvised because sometimes those jokes just feel so organic. Mm-hmm. Have y'all seen um, anything like? Was it Toast of London or um, Garth Marenghi? I've I've watched some of Toast of London on your recommendation. I've never been able to get into it, but I I, I think it's one of those things where I just need to to knuckle down and do it because I love love Matt Berry, love that British humor. It's it's so good. Uh, it's one of those things where it is odd. It is weird. He's been in a couple of really really weird shows, mm-hmm. but. I don't know. All the ones that I've watched through, I, I feel like I enjoy to the end. He's good in IT crowd. Like I feel like he's that he's an underrated underrated component of IT crowd too. Yeah. Cause he, he comes in and the, the previous boss already had that crazy energy. And yeah. then Matt Matt Barry just dials it up even further when you didn't think that was possible. <laughs> when he busts into the 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 church and screams father like that's so good <laughs> apparently i was just looking at his uh, wikipedia page he in 2021 he's uh playing king poseidon's voice uh in the new spongebob movie wow i'll take it yeah you get to watch the movie I mean, movie show podcast <laughs> that wasn't I, a I also noticed he's the voice for I think it's the Advil commercials uh, where you know the the tagline is something like pain says you can't Advil says you can but it's very exaggerated and British I'm like 95% sure it's Matt Barry I, I see this is I'm so disconnected I don't even have TV anymore so I don't know any of the commercials you know what? I'll just like uh, with Brian Cox, I'll, I'll drop in at the start of this episode, unless I'm completely wrong about it, like I was about the other side. <laughs> I agree well, with that the- improv. I be I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't five takes of Nadja's name calling insults of her just saying random words until they get the one they like. I'd yeah, watch that. I could see that. That'd be great. This poopy poopy butt arseholes. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm horrible at the accent. Maybe don't put that in the recap. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that part's going in the recap for sure. Well, I, I'm not in charge of the recap. The, we have a AI algorithm that does that for us. Oh, it finds the most quality clips and combines them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, since this is a, a, a round tour, I guess we there's not as much to explore, but I do want to know. This season, coming into the show, what was your scores? What's our pre-score scores? Are we? How do we want to do that? Do we want to talk about our full scores, and then we, we'll talk about how it's changed or not changed? Sure, let's do our. We can do our, our pre-show scores. Uh, for me, I wrote down a nine uh, for mm-hmm. this show. Uh, like, I just kind of. Aaron said something at the beginning that I completely agree with. You know, big claim time. This is the best comedy on TV right now. Yeah. And, you know, I just I, I love it to death. Now, why not 10? Uh, I kind of personally reserve 10 for shows that move me on a kind of greater emotional level. Shows like Chernobyl or or uh, or Band of Brothers that make me think about thing these like great concepts like truth or blood brotherhood or sacrifice 
you know, what, what we do in the shadows, it, it doesn't make me do that. But is it everything I want out of a comedy? Yes. So there's my nine. What about you, Tony? Uh, me, I think it might be obvious. I'll be the lowest one since I wasn't chiming in too much on this one. I was a 7.5 before. I think I'll raise it up to an eight. But the reason I'm lower, I think, is like when it hits for me, it really hits like select episodes, Jackie Taytona. I'm a sucker for Jermaine Clement, like in the finale when he pops back up again uh, in guest stars. But as I said before, I don't particularly enjoy the ones where Craig Robinson has a, a big role. So some of the episodes fall flat for me where others are like great. So it's more of really good and not quite that nine level like you feel. So my final score would be an eight superb owls out of ten. I think I think that's very fair. I, I I'm coming in, or at least I came into this episode with an eight five, and I'm going to stick with the eight five because uh, number one, I do think that it is one of the better sitcoms, if not best sitcoms, on television right now. But I I do feel that they are a little bit flying by the seat of their pants. Like it's it's very funny it's very good but i didn't like how disjointed the jump from episodes 8 9 10 felt mm. uh, even though all those episodes are fantastic episodes in and of themselves there it felt disjointed and and so i i loved it i am continuing to watch it actively now as the new season is coming out but um they need to figure out how they're going to tell the story cuz i'm i'm what i'm concerned with is that a lot of times these shows where you have these eternal characters that that don't change, it it can get boring. And if you push it too long, then it stops being funny and it starts being The Office in the last three seasons. Um, so I hope that they they know what they're doing and they're able to land it in a way that makes it a, a nice, enjoyable show to watch through. Well, how how does this show stand up against... Aaron's eternal law of television. Uh, best television is about bad people. I mean, it does. I mean, honestly, down to each wire, like Guillermo is terrible because he goes and gets people for vampires to eat, but he also kills vampires. Laszlo is just like a eternal selfish slob. Nadia's, you know, constantly bitching about Laszlo's infidelity, but also is, you know, someone who has had like a thousand year affair with, with Gregor or 300 year affair with Gregor. Um, and, you know, Nandor is just oh, very. Jesk. 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 But uh, that, that's really funny that it just keeps getting more hard to say Jeff. But th- they're all, I think, terrible people. Colin Robinson, like, will, will feed off of his own, you know, friends. Which is what I thought was funny about him kind of complaining about them not wanting to be around him. But he's already shown a propensity to drain them whenever he can. So, you know, sucks to be you, but you kind of brought this on yourself a little bit. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it fits to me. You tell me if I'm wrong. I, I feel like they are all pretty terrible people. Guillermo tries to be nice. But being nice, you can be a nice, terrible person, right? <laughs> No, no, I, I, I agree. It would, it wouldn't be interesting to watch a show about four uh, caring and loving vampire roommates. You know, we, we want to see them be, be selfish assholes and then have some comeuppance at some yeah. points. No, completely agree, and, and that's kind of part of the funny. Like the, the whole saga with Jim the vampire was so funny because it escalated into what it escalated into. Right. Right. So, and I love that whenever he came back and he's like, I've had a life changing experience. He's like, you've been gone for three days. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cause the, the whole conflict with Jim, the vampire, it was over one month's rent. Right. Yeah. From like a hundred years ago. <laughs> I love that. He was so into the girls volleyball game too. <laughs> Yes, and the way he was dressed on the sideline. 
Oh man, that that episode. The, one of the reasons that it it worked so much for me was because I initially dismissed it as I was like, "This was this is going to be stupid," and then it completely won me over. Like I, it it did a magic trick with it, and and especially with the joke about the toothpick, where at first when he shows his his foolproof disguise as a toothpick and a pair of jeans, I thought this is a this is just a really stupid joke that they're going to string out for the rest of the episode. But by the time we get to the end where Nadja is not able to recognize him with the toothpick in his mouth, it, you know, it, it worked for me. And I think that's, that's really a, a symbol of how good the writing on the show was at some points. Yeah, no, I agree with that. It's oh, good. Him and Nadja were role-playing, weren't they? At the end of that episode. No, I thought that was, that was the joke where, you know, he comes in with the toothpick, and when he takes it out, she says, "Oh, geez, it's you, Laszlo. Like, you uh, know, I, you scared me half to death." You're probably right. Maybe, maybe I just bit on the joke too hard. I could see you being more right than me. I thought the joke on the rent thing was like, yeah, I guess the joke is that it's not very much money, but I thought the joke was maybe that like the interest for like all those years for that one month of rent has like ballooned into like <laughs> quite a large sum of money, which is why he's so scared of it. And then Jim's like, few vampires would be able to pay such a large sum as you owe me. Like his debt is so large or whatever. Yeah, but that's I, possible. I think yours is more correct on it. Just being like, the joke is that it's such a small amount that he's unwilling to pay even a little bit. Right, because because Laszlo is a little bit lovable two bit con man, right? Yeah. No, he definitely. He, it's didn't he play that role in in Community too? Like the he was the professor of the like con professor. Oh yeah, he is. Yeah, they have like competing cons against each other. I think. <laughs> But he plays it so well. Like he he plays the convincing, you know, con man very very well. His voice lulls you into the con. <laughs> it's so soothing. Well, what? So I guess what does our our score give us? We didn't do our final calculations, Jay. Ah, thank you for the reminder, Aaron. Actually, I uh, I apologize. I got that you were initially an eight point five. Where did you land? No change. Like no I, change. I feel like coming in, my criticisms of the show, small though they were, that were unchanged. I feel like I enjoyed it just as much as I could enjoy it. It's a great show. I think 8.5 is a very fair score, but there's, it's not perfect, like you said. Well, here am I showing how dumb I am with numbers again. I'm using a calculator to find that the average of 8, 8.5, and 9 is 8.5. So <laughs> there's nothing wrong with checking your work. <laughs> Fair enough. And let's see where that stacks up on our all time list as we consult the it has to ancient be high, I think. Let's see. This is gonna put it one, two, three, four, five in sixth place overall, uh, just below the boys and just above Doom Patrol. Where did season one stack up? Season one was an eight even, uh, which is just a little bit more down the list. And actually, I think I I have not updated the master list I'm looking at right now after White Lotus. So, okay, White Lotus was an 8.167, so that's still going to be below what we're talking about here. But yeah, uh, what we do in the shadows now taking the spot in one, two, three, four, five, six place. I think it deserves it. It was it was that funny. Yeah, and I'd say uh, for me, you know that that's a a good representative improvement from season one to season two as well, uh, because you know both of them very good, but I think season two is just a little bit better. Yeah, I I hope that they get a little bit more succinct with their storytelling. Like it it's very funny, and you can kind of Star Trek it, watch one episode, and it's got a self contained story. But I, I feel like that they have some good storytelling that they can do with the show. 
Fair enough. I I did enjoy the monsters of the week, especially like we talked about Jackie Daytona, but also the superb owl party episode. Yeah, amazing. Well, are we ready for the wheel of randomonium? I believe so. <laughs> Jay took over my chant, my monk chant. <laughs> All right. So for our uh, our podcast listeners out there, uh, we are consulting the wheel of randomonium, and if you want to see this. Well, not live, but you want to see this visually, uh, you can check this out on our YouTube page. I guess so that we can kind of let everyone know what we're doing. We each brought our show in this week. We put it onto the wheel. We'll spin, and we'll have a random selection for our next show. Uh, This uh, round, I am bringing the Hulu original series Future Man, which uh, is one of my favorite little sci-fi satires out there. I feel like it does not get enough love uh, or notice. And so I'm putting it on the list because I think that it's something worth watching all the way through. So, uh, Jay, you, you have what is it again? I have offered Emmy nominee Emily in Paris, uh, a Netflix original series, which I hear is terrible. Oh. So the exact opposite. This is, are, we, are, we, are we dipping back into uh, Siesta Key territory or is it like a different kind of terrible? Uh, this one, I have not seen a single second of the show. So. Okay, good. So we're bl- walking in blind. I like that. I like that. Walking in blind. All right. And Tony? Mine is Emmy nominated Mayor of East Town on HBO. I don't really know anything about it. I think as Kate Winslet and she does some sort of detective work, is my general vibe I got from the small amounts of previews, previews I've seen. Well, that seems very mysterious. <laughs> Shuffling for good measure. It's better to not know anything about the show. We can come in fresh, I, you know. I, I guess you're going, you're going in blind on two, and then one is something that I think that is is very good. So hopefully, we watch something worth watching. All right, spin, 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 spin. Future man, future man, and future man. I did not rig that in any way. <laughs> Uh, this the show is corrupt in a lot of different ways, but not in that way. This is true. I I will say this. I I'm glad with the cast that they chose to go with in Future Man. They're not big names. They seem to all be side characters and anything else I've ever seen them in. Uh, but uh, I will say uh, I think Haley Joel Osment is in both this and we saw him in What We Do in the Shadows. So that's always fun. He he always has a brings a great energy to these shows. Well, uh, Future Man at this point has put out three seasons. Yes. So how how much are we watching here? I will say this. It is a self-contained story, three seasons, and that's it. Um, I would happily rewatch all three if we want to give ourselves a little longer than we normally give since we're d- doing it so quick. Uh, but it's up to you guys. I will say I, I, I personally believe they land the ending, and it's worth it. But uh, I will see – the the level of commitment to the council well i'm i'm okay with doing it all you know we've done we've done three episodes in five weeks so we've been we've been cranking them out uh so you know i I don't mind taking on a little bit larger of a project yeah are these uh more like 23 minutes or are these more 40 let me let me see i don't remember uh it's, it's been a while i just remember not being able to stop (laughs) <laughs> I will say one last uh, compliment for what we do in the shadows. Like I think the costume and set design and even the special effects, which mu- they must be on a limited budget being on a TV network. I think those are all top notch, like super high quality for what we do in the shadows. So it looks like future man's going to average about 30 minutes an episode and 34 total episodes. That, that sounds doable. Yeah, that's I was my alternate was going to be Gurren Logan, which is like 26 episodes at 30 minutes each. So, oh, sweet. Yeah, it's only 17 hours, so not too bad. <laughs> so Tony's going to have to start the day before this time rather than the day. Yeah, of. can't wait for the day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, break, the day. break this one up a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, I am <laughs> beyond excited because this is a show that I have preach the gospel to many people and not many people have actually watched it so <laughs> I, I i'm excited to see what the the show show has to say about it because again i i when a show lands it 
like it, it really lands it. it my opinion parks and rec is one of those great shows that that landed their ending uh a lot of people disagree with me but it's better than uh, how i met your mother okay aaron's taking a big risk here we'll find I out know. how it so, pays off for him i'm throwing gauntlet down all right <laughs> Oh, man. Well, uh, to all of our listeners out there, we thank you very much for joining us for the show today. Uh, we invite you to check out our social media accounts, as we described before. Biggest reason why is we're going to be coming out with our information on our upcoming nationwide tour. And big announcement this week, we're going on a cruise. You've heard of the Impractical Jokers cruise. You've heard of the Star Wars cruise. Get ready for the Show Show cruise. Each ticket will come with full, like, hazmat regalia. But no Ow. life preserver. No flotation. Nope. nope. Definitely not enough of those. It's, it just happens to be the maiden voyage of the Titanic. Now, for that cruise, we are going to need suggestions for a nautically themed show to review. So uh, send in those submissions to our email address, to our Twitter, to our uh, Wherever else you can find us, we're looking forward to those suggestions. And don't just send the love boat. We've got that one. I thought it was going to be the most dangerous job one where you fishing for crabs. Oh, deadliest catch? That's the one. Ooh, yeah, that's not a bad idea. People apparently like to watch that stuff. Also, have we finalized the talks for this will also be filmed as a below deck miniseries, I believe, right? <laughs> We're we're still in talks with Bravo on that one, but I'm I'm confident that we can meet in the middle somewhere on on the salary talking points. Yeah, they're gonna have to put up big bucks if they want to capture this talent. You know, we're we're busy guys, and we, uh, you know, we we love bringing this content to you, our fans. Um, but you know, sometimes we uh, we've got to be compensated. Well, and with that, I say that we say salutations, Internet, and check up on us next time. See you next time. <laughs> Goodbye.